In the last video, we described preload as a volume of blood inside the heart when it contracts. The more blood present, the greater the stroke volume. While this definition is more or less accurate, it is perhaps a little oversimplistic. As the heart fills between contractions, the growing volume of blood will cause the ventricles to stretch. This stretching of the muscle will continue until the heart contracts, pushing most of the blood out of the ventricle. A more accurate definition of preload would therefore be the amount of stretch experienced by the cardiac muscle just before contraction. It would follow that the greater the degree of stretching in the left ventricle, the greater the volume of blood that would be ejected on contraction. Unfortunately, it's not quite that simple. To understand why, we can look at how a slingshot works. For those of you not familiar, a slingshot is a kind of very primitive weapon used by many a child to torment their siblings and classmates. A piece of elastic is attached between two ends of a fork stick. The force generated by stretching the elastic can be used to launch pebbles at unsuspecting victims. If we were to come across a particularly annoying colleague or fellow student with a back to us, then we could use a slingshot to dish out some well-deserved revenge in the form of a pebble to the back of the head. On our first attempt, we only stretch elastic slightly. Not surprisingly, the force generated is fairly abysmal and nowhere near enough to hit our target. On our second attempt, we stretch elastic a bit more. We generate quite a bit more force this time and the pebble travels further, but still lands a long way off the mark. On the third attempt, the pebble travels further still and we nearly hit our target, so we put even more effort into the force attempt. But this time, despite increasing the pressure on the elastic band, the pebble travels only a short distance further than on our previous attempt. We put in one last effort, stretching the elastic as far as we were able, and find that the pebble doesn't travel any greater distance at all. This is because, as any naughty school child will be able to tell you, the stretchiness of an elastic band is not infinite. There is an optimum stretch. Beyond this, you won't generate any additional power. In fact, you may even find that your projectile travels a shorter distance. Earlier in the video, we defined preload as the degree of stretch exerted upon the muscle of the ventricle before contraction. Filling the ventricles with blood is much like pulling back on the elastic of the slingshot. The more blood in the ventricle, the greater the degree of stretch of the muscle fibres. This stretch is converted into power when the heart contracts. Let's take a closer look at the muscle fibres. The fibres that make up the muscle are composed of two elements, myosin and actin. Muscle contraction is produced when these two components pull together. When the muscle relaxes, they draw apart again. An increase in preload will push the actin and myosin further away from each other during the resting phase of the cardiac cycle. The further apart they are pushed, the more forcefully they will come back together when activated during contraction. This more forceful contraction will push a greater volume of blood out of the heart, leading to an increase in blood pressure. We can now see why there is a direct relationship between preload and stroke volume. However, if the actin and myosin are pushed too far apart, then their ability to pull back together effectively becomes impaired. Like the slingshot, the degree of stretch is good, but at a point it becomes counterproductive and will no longer result in increases in contractive power. The relationship between preload and stroke volume was first studied in detail by the German physiologist Otto Frank and the British physiologist Ernest Starling. It has since come to be known as the Frank-Starling law of the heart. We can describe a very simple version of the Frank-Starling law on this graph. The horizontal axis shows preload and the vertical axis stroke volume. The curve of the graph describes what effect preload will have on the stroke volume. We shall split the graph into three sections, A, B and C, to study it in more depth. If we look at section A, we can see that an increase in preload will have a significant effect on the stroke volume. 
in section B, an increase in preload, still produces an increase in stroke volume, but the increase will be small. In section C, increasing preload no longer has any effect on stroke volume. We can stretch the ventricles as much as we like, but it will no longer produce any improvements in blood pressure. In theory, we could use Frank Starling law to predict how a patient's blood pressure will respond to a medical intervention aimed at increasing preload. But there are multiple factors that will affect the preload of the heart. Here are some examples. To keep things simple, we will once again be representing the heart showing only the left ventricle and the aorta. Hopefully most of you will recognise that this is far from being anatomically correct, but it should be sufficient to demonstrate some basic principles. Fast heart rates can significantly reduce cardiac preload by reducing the time available for the ventricles to fill and stretch between contractions. In some heart rhythms, such as ventricular tachycardia, or VT, the filling time can be so inadequate that cardiac output can be lost completely, leading to cardiac arrest. Mechanical ventilation can interfere with preload. A ventilator functions by pushing air into the lungs to inflate them. As it does, the pressure within the chest will increase. This pressure effectively squeezes the heart preventing the muscle from stretching. The use of a ventilator can have a significant effect on blood pressure. The venous system is responsible for returning deoxygenated blood back to the heart and lungs once it has travelled through the body's organs. The degree of dilation or constriction of the venous system will influence the rate at which the heart fills with blood between contractions. For example, if we become stressed, then our sympathetic nervous system will be activated. This will trigger our veins to constrict, increasing the pressure within, and therefore the blood flow into the heart. The heart will fill more quickly, leading to a greater volume of blood and increased preload of the ventricles. The volume of fluid circulating within our arteries, veins and capillaries is also going to significantly impact on preload. If this volume becomes depleted, for example, if we become dehydrated or we suffer a loss of blood, then there will be less fluid available to fill and stretch the ventricles. Preload and therefore stroke volume will suffer. Administering fluids is one of the most common interventions for reduced blood pressure in hospitals. However, it should always be done cautiously. If we overload the patient with more fluid than their cardiovascular system can handle, then not only will it not improve their stroke volume, but the fluid may end up in places where it is not wanted. Most worryingly, excess fluid can build up in the lungs, leading to potentially life-threatening breathing difficulties.